Okay, let me just like try to fix the camera real quick. Um, I think this is good. All right, well, hello. Oh, that's a little too zoomed in for me. All right, how about how about this? All right, this sounds good. All right, um, hello, hello, everyone. My name is Ryan from Avatar Aquatics, and it has been a very long time since the last time I did a stream. Um, a couple things going on in my life right now, but I'm really happy to be able to do this stream for you guys in the middle of the day. So that's what YouTube tells me that most of my viewers are on. So hopefully we get a big audience today. Um, I wanted to talk about my breeding experiences and like how I got into fish breeding, how I got into keeping fish. So a lot of this is going to be like me thinking back, but um, I think we should start um, from the most recent to the most um, you know, far away so that I have the most to speak about. And I know a lot of you guys subscribe to my channel because you guys want to hear about tetras and shrimps and etc. So my tetra breeding experience is right now I'm working on breeding the rummy nose tetra. It's a little bit different than the cardinal tetras or the video drop. I dropped a video today on breeding the emperor tetra. And it's really, for me, it's one of the most um, hard to find tetras in a fish store because if you go to petco or PetSmart or even your local fish stores they don't always carry the emperor tetra but i find that to be really problematic because i really like the emperor tetra they're super bold fish and when you think about rummy nose or cardinals or even neons and ember tetras these fish if you're not in a big enough school these fish will all like pretty much just always hide in the aquarium but an emperor tetra, you can keep them by themselves and they'll still come out into the open. They're super bold and they'll like beg you for food and you'll always see them. Um, of course, I'm not abdicating to keep a schooling fish um, alone, but I'm just saying these guys are so bold to the point where it doesn't matter how, like, how much cover that you have. They're basically not going to use that cover in the tank. We always talk about giving uh, cover, um, <clears throat> excuse me, giving cover to your fish to make them feel comfortable. But the emperor tetra is like, unless you've got your net, you know, in the water, just like stirring things around, the emperor tetra is not going to like care about the cover at all. And I think they're even bolder than my uh, German blue rams, which is really cool. I will say though, um, some of the larger dominant males are a little bit nippy. <clears throat> excuse me, are a little bit nippy um, towards the females um, of that species. I don't think they go um, bother any of the other tetras or the other fish in the tank, but the males certainly have like a pecking order compared to more peaceful tetras like obviously your neons or your rummy nose tetras. They almost never fight. But the males will try to like pick on the females as well as each other and only the dominant ones, like once they establish that hierarchy, um, you're pretty much good. Excuse me. I need to like take a drink of water or something. But one of the biggest um, things that I try to do when I'm breeding fish is to try to do things in a way that number one is effective. Um, so if there's like a method that gives you one or two fry, versus a method that gives you 10 or 12 or 10 or 20, I would much rather go with the 10 or 20, right? That's like an obvious no brainer. But another uh, aspect of con considering how to breed fish is the cost associated with it. Um, I know not everyone has like all the money in the world to throw into this hobby. So I really try to use the cheapest equipment that I can use safely and effectively and then have that somehow give me something in return so that I can either increase my schools in my own tanks or have enough fry to sell to you know the people in my community my my clubs um, and that way make back what I initially invested into that breeding hobby or breeding project and therefore end up with both that amazing experience that I can videotape and talk about online and also 
have enough money in the end or make enough money back so that I either break even or even get a little bit more money that I can then start going into the next breeding project for. So I got a question from a viewer of mine that asked me, you know, Ryan, what do you do with the fish that you end up breeding and, you know, raising up? And especially for like the German blue rams, I usually sell the fish in my local clubs. Um, we have auctions every, every uh, month or so. I don't think I've had the, I've ever been to one of the in-person meetings or the auctions because of like a certain thing going around the past year. Um, that's been a problem with in-person meetings, but we do online meetings every month and I even got to speak at some of these meetings on breeding the Amano shrimp. And I know the next week I'm going to be speaking at the club about breeding the Cardinal Tetra, which is amazing. Cause I, I just, I, I, I finished that project and I love it so much. It was, it was amazing. It was like one, it's basically one of my favorite breeding experiences. I am, um, I don't know what, what is going on with my throat today. I'm not sick. Um, I just don't really know. So one of the things that I'm struggling with, like a, a dilemma, a choice that I have to make now is, do I get an RO system to breed Tetras? Because we always say we need really soft water, like distilled water, RO water, um, or rainwater. And number one, I don't want to wait years and years or months and months and weeks and weeks for the rainwater. Um, distilled water and RO water are pretty much the same price around me at around 79, 80 cents a gallon. So if I buy 10 gallons, that's eight bucks. If I buy 50 gallons though, that's $40, right? But if I were to buy like a, like an RO system that gives me like 50 gallons a day, that would be, that would be like, what, 50, 61, $60, $50, $60. And I would have so much RO water at the end that I don't even know what like I would use that with. The only issue with RO is that number one, I have to figure out how to set it up. I've never done RO water before. I am 100% freshwater scrub other than maybe that little venture into salt water with the Amato shrimps. And so I don't really know how to do RO water. Um, I heard that they make like four times as much waste water as the actual RO water. And like assuming that if you do a little bit of math, assuming that I start off with 100 TDS per milliliter in my, in my tap water and then connect that to the RO system. And I ended up with 1.33 TDS per milliliter once I you know, run that through the RO system and I collect the wastewater. That's how much TDS it would be per mil. Hi, Rohan. Um, it's very nice of you to join us today. Let me know if you have any questions. Whereas the, the actual RO water is going to be zero TDS, right? So I'm thinking about um, using the money I got from, the, from YouTube to invest in an RO system, but I'm also thinking about buying like another fish to raise up so I can breed something after my rummy nose tetra breeding project. Because the way things go is that I can't just say, okay, I'm done with the rummy nose or I'm done with the cardinal tetra. I'm moving on to the emperor tetra because the way that like it took me six to seven months to raise the cardinal tetras to breeding project size. And with the Emperor Tetris, I think it took me like maybe four months or so to breed the, or to raise them large enough to breed. With the Rummy Nose, I've had those for a long time too, like almost as long as the Cardinals. So I need to start thinking about like what's going to come after the Rummy Nose Tetras. Like what am I going to breed after the Rummy Nose and get them now? Because if I don't, I'm not going to have the fish to do once I finish my Rummy Nose project. Um, and, you know, a lot of YouTubers like keep these under secrets and maybe I should start being more secretive. But for me, it's like talking about that. Yes, I'm like trying to figure out Romy Nose Tetras. I thought they would be really similar to Cardinals, but 
for some reason it's not doing it for me um hopefully like other people have heard of experiences or have done them have done the rumios themselves and are able to you know provide me with some with some sort of like fact factual information which brings me to one of the things that i kind of want to like rant or maybe not rant but warn you guys about um, when it comes to doing research online um, and the biggest ex uh, example that i can give you is when we're talking about the cardinal tetra and neon like everyone says that the fry are photosensitive and i made sure to do that exact experiment growing and hatching the eggs under a very bright led light and there was no problems with doing that so either everyone else just like you know copied and pasted off of each other which if you go online and you look at all these like different websites on breeding the cardinal tetra they all skim the information very very briefly and they all say pretty much the same thing so what i'm thinking is one author does research um maybe the the source is written in another language right and it could be that the first primary literature the first person who bred cardinals and wrote about it had said that the fry or or or, or are nocturnal right which is true. They they are much more active at night compared to during the day. But the translation ends up being that the fry are photosensitive, that they are averse to light, which isn't true because once that photosensitive claim goes around, people start taking it and understanding it as if light will kill them. And, and that's not true, at least according to all the research, all the experiments that I've done. So number one is to take things with a grain of salt. Um, a lot of people write articles to either sell a product or they write articles without actually doing what they claim the article is doing. Like not everyone breeds cardinal tetras and write about it because this, like the cardinal tetra is like, a very there's a lot of money involved in breeding the cardinal tetra which is why like you know brazil um colombia all these places in the south america continent i'm not really sure where um i think it's the rio negros where they're from but all these places are exporting the cardinal tetra they're trying to get people to buy wild caught because they're saying you know, if you buy wild caught tetras from us, our fishermen are then going to go out and collect the tetras, right? And they're not going, what they're not going to do is go out and cut down, cut down the trees. There's a, there's a booming industry in South America, like cutting down the rainforest. And they're saying, if you buy from us, our fishermen will do all they can to stop these companies from coming in and destroying the cardinal tetra habitat. And that for me is like a very, very noble cause. However, well, the issue is in my area in North Carolina, my local fish stores in North Carolina, I'm not going to name names, but these stores carry the wild caught Tetras. And when I went there, I was like, you know, I'm all for this, right? This is, you know, this is a good cause. I'm all for it. But the issue is when I bring these wild caught tetras back to my home and I acclimate them and I give them the best water that I know to be good, right? Super soft water, acidic, full of tannins, all that, all that stuff, right? The right temperature, high temperatures for cardinal tetras. They don't make it. And so the issue for me is I can't acclimate them to my tanks. And I'm, I'm talking about like I bought 15 tetras. 15 cardinal tetras within two days of getting them 10 of them were gone three of them were struggling and two of them was like okay maybe they might have made it who knows same thing with the rummy nose i bought 10 rummy nose tetras tried to raise them up and for some reason at that local fish store i don't know if it's the manufacturer the distribution chain or whatever is going on that local fish store 
it doesn't work. Whereas if I go to my Petco near me, and this Petco is like, I'm so happy that I live next to this Petco because, you know, I was there yesterday. And you know what I found at a Petco? I found the African butterfly fish. Have you ever find, have you ever seen an African butterfly fish at a Petco before? I have never. And they also carry Amano shrimps, cherry shrimps, r- red really shrimps. And they have like all the, then Rumino's, Cardinal Tetras, of course. This, this Petco, like whoever's managing this Petco really knows his stuff. And I know it's a he because, you know, I talked to some of the staff there and, and the manager is a he. So I'm not just using he as a, as like a, like a pronoun. I know it's a he. Um, where was I? So for me, breeding projects, uh, to source the breeders from, you're probably the best bet is going to be either ordering online from someone from a really highly rated website like Aquahuna, Flip Aquatics. Or um, I think if you're doing like shrimp breeding, um, I think it's Buse Plants. Um, I think they have some they have some shrimp, and it's going to be expensive. Um, you're looking at maybe like six or seven bucks a shrimp, and that's because of shipping. However, um, if you're able to look around in your community and look at the breeders themselves, a lot of like my club. The, the Raleigh Aquarium Society um, has these things called the, the Breeder Awards Program. And I'm sure a lot of the aquarium clubs have the same thing where, you know, if you breed something, you can document it, submit the fry to someone else in the club and get points off of that or something. So those are that's like tetra breeding for me. Um, and then, ooh, I got a new I got a new toy. It is. I hope you guys can see that. It says, okay, it actually doesn't really say what it is, but if I were to open it and show you. Oh, Indian almond leaves. I've been looking to like actually buy like an actual plant that will supply me with multiple Indian almond leaves per season. But the issue is, I can't find an Indian almond plant, number one. And of the things that I find online, it seems like they're all from pretty sketchy websites. And I'm not about to spend like 50 bucks on a sketchy website. So as a student, I don't have that kind of money. Um, So if anyone on this uh, uh, live stream have heard of where you can buy an Indian almond leaf plant, like an actual live plant, Please, please let me know. I'll probably have to keep it in a tub or, or like a pot because, okay, now I can't put these leaves back in. Um, I don't I don't want to like hurt them. I guess I'll take them all out. But this is on Amazon. I got this on Amazon and it was like 10 bucks um, for like 25 pieces. So this is a real life review. Oh, I just dropped one. Real quick, one second. This is a real life review. Um, these guys are almost as big as my face. There are some bigger ones here, but like the average size is probably going to be maybe around six inches or or eight eight inches on on the long side, and maybe maybe like five to six inches on the shorter side. And then some of them are obviously a little bit bigger. Covers my face. Like we have like these big ones and then they also give you like the small ones, right? See if there's like a difference here. Yeah, this is a really big plant and um, I'm hoping that I can actually get a real plant so I never have to buy any more leaves online. And also like what's with Indian almond leaves? It's why, are, why is it just the Indian almond leaf plant? Why can't we use other types of plants? Um, like there's an oak tree just right outside my house. Can I use that? Or do they just use the Indian almond leaf plant because the leaves are super big, you know? And in which case, like, can I use my magnolia tree? I have a magnolia tree and 
The magnolia leaves are super big too, and they're really tough. Oh my God, if I put this in wrong, I'm going to crush all the leaves and it's going to like really hurt me. Guys, only in the, the fish breeding hobby will you ever see a guy on a live stream show his viewers his leaves and be so proud of that. <laughs> I don't think there's any other hobby out here that will be this excited about buying 10 bucks worth of leaves on Amazon, which is really intriguing to me. Like, can you imagine me having a conversation with like a normal person that isn't addicted to like fish keeping be like, yeah, I bought leaves off of Amazon and um, it's not the first time. I'm, I'm so, I'm, that would be such a cool and interesting conversation to hear from the outside. Oh, and let me show you another thing that I got recently. I got an asparagus fern. Look at these leaves. Look at that. They're so soft looking. And if you look down from the like bottom here, they kind of look like bamboo. Um, here, let me show you. I don't know if the light can hit that, but if you look down here, they look like bamboo. And it's such a cool plant. It was only $8 at my local gardening club. Very, very happy with it. And okay, so going back to breeding fish. So we talked a little about, about tetra breeding. I think the biggest issue with tetra breeding is actually not getting the eggs, but getting the fry to start eating. Um, for some reason, a lot of people lose a lot of fry when they go from like hatching out wigglers. They're not, they don't really wiggle. It's just more of like the, the yolk phase. And then as soon as the fry finish that yolk, for some reason, they, 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 it's hard for them to transition onto paramecium and infusoria. So a lot of times, like if you have 10 tetras hatching out, to, turning into free swimming, you're going to get like maybe like seven, five to seven tetras that actually transition to paramecium. And then you're going to lose like maybe one or two just for, just for like, um, just like, switching from paramecium to baby brine shrimp. But once you're on baby brine shrimp, it's basically smooth sailing. Unless you like put ice in the water or do like, or bleach or something horrible and horribly wrong. Um, it, once your tetras are on baby brine shrimp and you feed them well on baby brine shrimp, it's smooth sailing. You're going to have tetra babies. You ba you're basically, um, you're basically done. Rohan says, um, I prob probably the almond leaves is just a marketing strategy and that's very, very likely. Um, who knows? I'll, I will, you know what, Here, here's what I'll do. Um, as a YouTuber channel that really likes to talk about doing your own research and trusting your gut and and when I say do your own research, I mean like for this stuff, right? Like I got my Pfizer vaccines. I'm, I'm fully vaccinated. But I'm going to do the, um, the, the magnolia leaves and then I'm going to do the Indian almond leaves. And then we're, we're going to compare what happens to the water in like maybe three to four days after you put them in. Rohan, you are fed up breeding... I hope I'm saying your name right, Rohan. Um, but yeah, I'm fed up breeding my black skirts. Oh, those are another type of tetras. Um, after five or six days, they die, but I'll try again, I guess. Are you using the peat moss uh, substrate? Um, because what I've noticed is if you have the peat moss substrate and you're also adding infusoria, your fry are much more likely to survive. And if you're not noticing your fry after five or six days, um, I would say like, number one, use maybe like a three gallon tank. It's a smaller tank, smaller setup. So you're more than likely going to see the tetras as they develop. Another thing is you can try raising them in the containers. Like if you go to my 
Cardinal Tetra or even my um, Emperor Tetra video, which I dropped today, I will show you that I actually keep the eggs in these small containers about this big and this high. So like you're only going to have maybe like 300, 400 milliliters of water in this, right? And when you put in the methylene blue and they hatch out, they become babies, then you can start changing your, um, what, do you, what do you call it? Changing the, the water from the blue methylene blue water to like normal soft acidic water that they, the eggs were laid in. And the more you change that, the less methylene blue is going to be in the tank, right? You only really need methylene blue when number one, the eggs are still eggs and they're, you know, they're going to fungus over if, if you have any unfertilized eggs in there. And number two is like the very early in the, the breeding cycle when the tetras are like pretty much immobile and they're on the bottom, they're not moving a lot. So what you do is you have that container, you have like a small airline that kind of moves the water around, not like turning it and everything and, and like knocking the tetras all over the bottom of the tank because that, that'll, that'll probably hurt them. But just a little bit of water movement, then you do some water changes that way. And you can also try to raise your tetras in that small little cup without even putting them into a grow out container. Try that first and then start feeding if you're like feeding on the fifth day and you're noticing that they're all dying on that day, try feeding a little bit on the fourth day so that the tetras who are a little bit earlier developers can then like they'll wake up, they'll start eating, they'll start hunting. And then the, the majority will then start eating on the fifth day, right? So then you're, you've got both the early developers that are getting fed as well as the normal developers. I don't, I'm not, I haven't bred, um, black skirts so I don't know when they become free swimming but most of the time the issue is you don't have the right food to transition them onto actually like feeding infusoria so for me if you you can either try the peat moss method like keep trying man just keep trying because it like if you already have fry and you you manage to keep them for five to six days that tells me that your water parameter is correct you know how to breed them. Your adults are happy and they're fertile. And so essentially the biggest issue, especially after five or six days, is either you're not, you don't like, you're not changing water, you're not keeping the water clean so that, you know, over time, the, the, the to like me toxic me metabolic waste is accruing or you're not feeding them right with the right food. And so just keep trying. You can, Here's what you can also, what you can do is add a little bit of baby brine shrimp, add a little bit of infusoria or add a little bit of microworms into that small container so that that fry knows exactly where all the fish is. And if you don't have, if you'd like, if you don't know how, put also, you can also try a little bit of moss in there so that they can graze off of whatever's on the moss. Tango says, hey dude, I like your vids a lot. Have you buyed AMC stocks? I don't play with stocks. I'm not, I have the, no, uh, basically like zero um, information on, like I've heard about that GME thing, but I don't invest in stocks. Um, I invest, let me tell you what I invest in. I invested in a $300 CO2 setup um, a couple of years ago. And it has been the greatest thing that I've ever bought. Like it looks like I, I got a 10 pound aluminum co2 cylinder and it looks like a bomb and what i remember when i was like going back home after i picked up that like like big ass aluminum 10 pound cylinder i was like so scared it was gonna explode in the back of my car and like i was gonna like die on the freeway because like boom right but that those are the types of things that i invest in things that i know are going to help me and I'm not like, I'm not dissing stocks at all, but I just don't, I just don't go and look at stocks because I just have no idea how that works. Like they're talking like bullish markets. I don't know what that is. Okay. So my very first breeding project, can you guys guess what fish that I bred? And it's not guppies. So my very first breeding project was bettas. And it was something that I did with my dad. Um, 
And it, it meant a lot to me because during that time, we did not have that much aquarium funds. Um, and so we bred them in these little Tupperware, not Tupperware, Sterilite containers. And it wasn't even a real tank. It was just like a Tupperware container like this. And back then, all the bettas available in the fish stores were veil tails. There were no crown tails, no half moons, no anything else, nothing like that. It was just veil tail bettas. And I was just completely blown away at how blue these fish could be. I was a little kid. I was in elementary school. And so my dad bought me and my brother each a pair of fish. And we bred them in these little tanks. We, we fed them pellets, which, you know, I should probably do a conditioning video for fish because um, I, know, I know when I first started out that I had trouble conditioning my fish, especially the tetras. But then I realized it was just because they were too young. And that was the reason why I wasn't able to condition them. But like my feeding regimen was correct. Anyways, um, we were feeding, feeding them on pellets. We had no blood worms. We had no nothing else, right? And then they bred for us. And then we raised them on egg yolk. But if you've ever used egg yolk for little baby fish, you know that egg yolk is messy as heck. And it'll like pollute your water very fast. So then the second time we tried um, baby brine shrimp and that baby brine shrimp, we didn't have air pumps back then too. I'm not saying like there weren't air pumps in the market. I'm saying like, we just didn't have them. We had a box and fish and the baby brine shrimp, the way we hatched them was it was in these like giant ice cream containers. If you go to like Walmart or somewhere, you can buy those like big, big, tubs of ice cream you know the one with the clear or sort of like opaque plastic um and those buckets we would fill it up with water sprinkle in some eggs and then we would just like like pour the water into a net and then just dump the whole thing in like it didn't matter for us if there was like fish or the brine shrimp shells and it, it like somehow still worked we got i think maybe like five fry at the end of that one um that made it which was like amazing for me but now i'm just like five fry dang i didn't really do a good job now right <laughs> um but it was really cool and then we had to go back to taiwan for um a bit and then it ended up we ended up losing the fry because we gave it to a friend to take care of and um but i don't i don't blame them at all we we were the ones that went back so <clears throat> and then Rohan, the next thing that we did were live bears, which was a lot easier to breed than the bettas. And it, they were guppies. And I remember going to the store and getting my very first 10 gallon tank, which I still have that tank. Um, I'm actually currently raising uh, German blue ram babies in that 10 gallon, my very first aquarium. And we bought a kit, like those 10 gallon aquarium kits from I think Petco. That store is, st I still go to that store every now and then, but that 10 gallon kit, I remember coming home and setting it up and realizing that the lid had broken off like in transit somewhere. And so our lid was like screwed up because one side of like, you know, it, it, it like kind of slots into these two little like plastic nubs. And so you can like, it's like a hinge and one of the hinges was broken off. So you couldn't actually open the lid and close the lid on those hinges which is like devastating to me. And I was like, yo, let's go back and get another one, dad. But I, my dad was like, nah, we're just, gonna, we're just gonna roll with it. But he took us to the store and we bought, I remember we bought like three or four female guppies. And my dad was like, hey, Ryan, wanna see some cool? I was like, sure, let's see what it is. And he, he chose all the pregnant ones. <laughs> so when we got home, the day after, like, I kid you not, I remember this because, like, in my little child mind, I was just, like, blown away, like, oh, my God, what did we just do? Did we just, like, we just, like, broke the system here because we got home, right? And, oh, crap, what's going on with my hair? But a, a day after we got home, the female guppies had babies. And I remember we spent, like, 
an hour or so just with the net trying to net out all the babies and so so like that to me was like my very first couple breeding projects and now i'm on youtube i got 2k subscribers which at the beginning of the year i had i just hit 1k at the beginning of this year and now i almost doubled it within maybe four months or so i'm very happy um and I'm very thankful for all of my subscribers and everyone here watching the stream. These are like, it's just been a great journey. And then as I got older, you know, had my own jobs, got my own money. I started putting that into fish. And one of the things is like, we talk a lot about zebra fish, breeding zebra fish in college because I was a biology major. And that and breeding zebra fish has been like done so many times that it's basically now science or it's like every science lab, every biology lab that specializes in zebra fish have their own methods. And so I actually reached out to one of my friends who worked in a zebra fish lab and was like, Hey, can you help me breed this fish? And so she actually walked me through what I do, you know, like same with that, that slant, and putting that mesh on the bottom so the eggs fall through and keeping the water level like super, super low. And it was just like, the more I got into this, the more I, 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 I like, I, I was hooked. And then I started watching the green aqua, aquascapes. And then by then that was when I invested in that CO2 cylinder. I've never bred Corias before. Um, I want to but I've just never had the space for it. I'm also afraid that if I keep, if I keep the quarries like on the bottom, they'll like dig up all my plants, which I don't know if that's like a true statement. Rohan says I've hatched BBS with just water and left them outdoors to grow. I'm new to it. Yeah. So um, I actually don't have that bucket right now, but I have a little jar. It's about, it's about this size and that's an Anubius in there, but I have a jar. And inside is just like salt water and algae and baby brine shrimp. And the adults would like grow up, they would have babies. And then it was, it's like a never ending cycle. And I can like, I just like watching the baby brine shrimp. Well, I guess they're adult brine shrimp um, swimming around in the water. It's really cool. I know a lot of people just put a bucket of like algae and, and salt water outdoors and the brine shrimp will thrive. And every now and then, They'll take a net, go through, harvest, and feed that to their fish. I've green zebra fish outdoors in tubs three months now. Green zebra fish, are you talking about like the glow fish? Or is that like an actual species of, of new fish? Or is it just like the glow, glow fish and zebra fish? Okay. Google just says it's a green zebra danio, which is the glow fish. Which... I don't understand why people have such a problem with glowfish. They are literally just GFP. It's just, it's like a very common thing that people do. They put it in bacteria. They put it in animal, like mice, so human cells, every other cell. Um, and then it's just like, why do people have that much problem? It's like, yes, it's genetically engineered, but it's very common. And I have like, I have no problems with glowfish, but if I say that out loud, people would start attacking me and probably unsubscribing from my channel. Um, okay, so I guess Cory's don't dig up plants. Uh, what do you feed baby brine shrimp? So I, I have, um, if you go to um, my, I think a mono breeding video, I actually like talk about using tetrasomus algae, like it's a phytoplankton for, for feeding a mono shrimp. And so I would just pour some phyto in there and that ends up like feeding all of my baby brine shrimp. Sometimes I will also do some powdered fish food. I'll like put the fish food in a mortar and pestle and then just grind it up. But I'll use that to feed my baby brine shrimp and it works a lot. Uh, it works very well they don't actually need that much food. Um, they, they just kind of like chill there. Do, have you, so Rohan, have you realized like, do your fish, do the uh, Danios breed in your tubs? 
or are they kind of just like there you know yeah i bet they would be beautiful under the sunlight i think they're beautiful under like the black lights that they have at the stores too um it looks it looks awesome but they're always like 5.99 where i'm from and holy crap it's like kind of cold Sorry, give me one second. I'm gonna respond to something. Okay. Um yeah, people they are they they are tattooed fish. I'm sorry, I don't understand what that message means. Are you saying that they're taboo fish? Um I can't really I can't really tell. Okay, well, if you have like outdoor tubs, I recommend breeding cherry shrimp or any other like color of the shrimps, or you can do white cloud mountain minnows. I put in seven mountain minnow, like they weren't even adults, they were juveniles in at the beginning of like April. And at this point, I literally have like a whole nother generation and a bunch of little fry at like the top of the water. They like to hide among the like the floating plants because I have salvinia, duckweed, red root floaters on the top. It's a problem because I should never have added duckweed in there. Anyways, they like to hide in the top. And then I actually have like fry the same size of like the mountain minnows that I had originally put in there. So like we went through a whole generation and then plus a little bit more because the adults just keep breeding and keep breeding. And what I did was I took all of the extra like Java moss and Christmas moss and all the other mosses that I had lying around in my tanks. I just took that and just dropped it in my tank on the, like in, in, in the tub. And I also have like a, a lily, well, three lilies in there. And the, the lily pads would often like, you would see like the little fry just hanging out on the top, hiding from like the adults on the pond. It's really cool. Um, you know, you could, you, I think Java moss is probably one of the easiest, um, spawning like mediums that you could, you could use. And it's cheap too, especially if you have like a CO2 system. And a lot of times, like I would have so much moss that I would have to like find new tanks to put them in because all my tanks have now like been invaded with moss and those things for some reason, like they just don't die. You can put them in like very low light containers or like if you're outside, your water might be green because of all the algae and you just drop them in there. You'll never see the Java moss again, but they'll survive and the fish will breed inside of them. Um, let's see. Oh, and then what I didn't talk about was like, I actually have a video on breeding plecos in, 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 on YouTube, but for some reason that video never took off. And the plecos are like, they're kind of, they're kind of creepy to me. I think, I think plecos are kind of, they're super useful. I keep them because they like eat a bunch of crap in my, in my tanks. They're kind of creepy looking, especially with the, like the sucker mouth on the, on the glass. I, it just creeps, it creeps me out. Cause like, ugh, I can't, I can't, like watching snails eat is like, like I can kind of tolerate it, but it, it, after a while it just kind of, grosses me out i just feel like them crawling on your skin it'd be horrible um but like the pleco eggs they're so big i thought they were like they look like salmon eggs if you've ever had like sushi where they have salmon roe right the pleco eggs are so big and then when the when the pleco like grows out of it it just looks like it's like part of the yolk and it's it's kind of cool. It's cool, but kind of creepy. I don't think I'll ever do that again, unless it's like a super interesting type of pleco. Um, but I actually like figured out that my I had a male and a female on accident because I was like moving around the aquascape, and I was like, "What are all these orange things stuck to my stuck to my rock?" And it was because like the rock formation had been like a little cave, and the male had been in there, and I basically took away all his babies and bred them myself. I raised them myself. Oh, ooh, cichlids and German blue rams. So for the cichlids, I breed the um, 
angelfish and the German blue rams. I've always wanted to breed bluegills, but I don't have enough room to breed bluegills. Um, but with the angelfish, the first time that I bred angelfish, I think I got like maybe 10 fry at the end. And one of the most horrible things happened to those 10 fry. And it was like, I had them on like a hang on DIY breeder and it was like cinched tight to the side of the tank. So if, so I needed a certain water level in the tank so that it doesn't overfill. And then, cause if you overfill, the babies can then swim out right into the rest of the tank where the adults were. So one day my dad comes home and he has his water bottle that he like didn't finish like drinking, I guess, but he carries like three or four different like water bottles. Right. And so he pours all of those, like all the clean drinking water into my fish tank. And that had the effect of raising the water levels a past where it's supposed to go. So the babies all swam out and got like annihilated by the adults. And it was the saddest thing ever. I think I like actually cried that day. Um, and so it was fine. Cause he, had, he ended up going to the store and getting like little baby angels for me, but still you can't get them back. Um, whatever <laughs> but then you know like when, the next time i was like okay well i'm gonna do a float on top um that'll let, like change with the water level so that never happens again and i think my dad learned his lesson because i don't think he's ever done that before any like after that um but the german blue rams guys like if you i actually have like an actual series on my channel for the german blue rams and i put in a lot of different tips for for hatching them out Especially, uh, I think earlier I was talking about like actually breeding the fish in like the small containers. There's no problem with keeping fish and fry in there as long as you keep the water clean. And that's done with water changes every few days, depending on the size of your tank. So it took me three attempts to grow Java moss, LOL. I think if that sounds about right, um, my very first time growing dwarf baby tears, like the, the hard plants, um, they all melted. I had like basically nothing left. And the first time that I try to grow dwarf hair grass, the easy plant, they all melted and I had basically nothing left. So it's definitely not like, not everyone gets to have an amazing tank the first try. But if you keep trying and you keep like messing with the parameters and trying to figure out what went wrong, like you're going to have success at some point. And then once you do that, usually what keeps it's it's like if you're able to keep, say, dwarf baby tears or Java moth and they're thriving for you, chances are a lot of the other common plants that people use them together with, right? Are going to be perfectly fine and going to be perfectly happy because there's a reason why people put them together and it's because number one they look good together but number two that they grow well in similar conditions but you know once i got the co2 system it was like doing planted tanks on easy mode and there was like no more basically no more melting unless you like have plants that are trans um that are changing from submersed or immersed grow um and then here is what i want to ask people or what i'm trying to figure out it's like what fish do i breed next what do people want me to breed um i would take suggestions but in the end um, i'll probably only breed the fish that i have room for and that i have like in like like want to breed because i'm like i'm thinking about neon tetras but i also have pretty bad luck with neon tetras in terms of like taking them home and just having them all like crap out on me after a week and i don't think that's like the i don't think that's like a very unpopular experience with neon tetras if you google neon tetras dying 
there's going to be like countless articles of that fish just like like if you look at them wrong they'll just like die which is a problem and then one of the things that i didn't really have that many problems with was the german blue rams um at six of them i think actually no no um after like a couple of months i lost one or two of them and then i gave away one of them so i i yeah, it was about like maybe like an eighty percent survival rate. What's what's losing one and two of them out of six? I don't even know. I can't do math right now off off the top of my head. But a lot of people say German blue rams have an issue, right? Like with like with keeping them alive. But I think it's the biggest thing is making sure that they are the boss of the tank, and feeding live baby brine shrimp which if you if you're not feeding live baby brine shrimp when you bring your fish home from the fish store or when you like unbox them from an online salesperson you are doing things wrong you should always hatch baby brine shrimp before you bring your fish home and then once you bring your fish home just feed them live baby brine shrimp don't don't feed them flakes because they're probably not going to go for it for the first day um, unless they're like used to feeding on flakes. But if you feed baby brine shrimp, they're almost always going to want to eat it. And that's because, number one, baby brine shrimp are amazing. I love them for basically anything that you can do with fish. And it, it speaks for itself that a lot of like fish farms use exclusively baby brine shrimp to raise their fish just because of a how cheap they are and b they're just very good for your fish my giant high grow has completely taken over the tank and roots piercing into the java moss and shading it so my java moss don't grow much well it looks like it's time to trim your high grow and try to sell it to someone so you can buy more java moss or more fish that's what i would do um but baby brine shrimp is like the perfect conditioning food and conditioning fish is like it's an art form you know they need to remain on their flake food it has to, like they need to remain on their basal diet and then you feed them something else so my basal diet is flake food Okay, so Rohan says, okay, so in your experience, do BBS eggshells kill fry if accidentally? Are you talking about like if you put egg shells in there and then the fry eat them and then they like get their GI tract blocked or something? You know, to me, that sounds like number one, it might be possible. But two, I've also seen a lot of fry eat them and then spit them out. And then not have like anything to do with it. I've all okay, so I've seen fry eat them and I've seen them in the stocks of the fry, but I've also seen fry eat them and then spit them back out. And I've also seen fry that have eaten them into their stomach and then pass it out like normal. So, number one, I think it would depend on the size of your fry and. Um, like if you have, if your fry are big enough to eat baby brine shrimp, um, which is usually like just off the top of my head for emperor tetras and cardinal tetras, that's about maybe two or three weeks after they, maybe three weeks after they hatch out from the eggs. They're big enough to tell the difference between baby brine shrimp and eggs. And then even if they do eat the eggs, they're also big enough to pass it safely. So when I have newborn fry that are just on baby brine shrimp, I would probably try to um, get rid of the eggs as much or the, the cysts as much as possible, just the shells. But later down the line, when I'm on like, when I'm past like a month, so maybe like on week five or six, it doesn't make as much difference because they're big enough to pass them. So that, that would be my answer. Number one, I would try to remove as much as I can very early in the breeding cycle. And two, when they're bigger, doesn't matter if there's a couple of eggs that go in there. You should you should be using okay. Look, if you see my um, B 
baby brine shrimp videos, I show you how I make my hang on breeding or my hang on hatchery. And the way, because you have like a water bottle, right? And it's sitting upside down like this. So all the babies fall to the bottom and the eggshells float to the top, which means all the babies are going to be down here. And you could just take a siphon or a turkey baster or whatever you need, siphon out all the babies, and you're only going to get a few unhatched eggs. Um, if you're looking for a place to get baby brine shrimp, um, I tried many different places. And without like, and giving my honest opinion without getting sponsored or anything like that, I would say the aquarium co-op eggs are really, really good. Like very, very good. It's like 20 bucks. Um, and you get a, like a whole can of them. It's not filled to the brim with the can. So if you're like, if you're in the, I think they only ship to the U S so if you're in the U S go for that one, the brine shrimp supply eggs, or I think brine shrimp, Brian, I think that's the name of the, of the, of the Brian, Brian Shrimp Direct, sorry. Brian Shrimp Direct eggs are good too. Um, but the aquarium co-op eggs have really nice egg and shrimp separation. And your hatch rate is like 95%. Very rarely see like cysts on the bottom. I'm not, I'm not like, I was skeptical at first. I was like, there's no way that it's going to hatch that well, right? but they do. And, you know, I've keep my extra eggs in the freezer and I just get like every now and then I'll just go in the freezer, open up the can and get some, get like a vial of eggs. But aquarium co-op eggs are really good. Um, Corey did a good job doing that. I don't think you do need, I don't think unless you really want to, I don't think you need the Zis brine shrimp hatchery that he keeps pushing on um, on his videos. You can do a lot with just a water bottle. And if you're not, if this water bottle is not big enough for you, get a one liter like water bottle, like one of those like clear, um, like Fiji water or something like that. Get a larger one or like a one liter Coke bottle. And if that's not big enough, get a two liter Coke bottle. You don't really need that Zis brine shrimp hatchery. Um, and, 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 the, and the benefit of having this water bottle on the side of, of like being cheap is that this goes into your tank and it gets heated by the tank heater. And you don't have to have anything else. You don't have to have another heater on it, in it. And some people say like using light can hatch your brine shrimp faster. Well, you have a light on your tank, right? Usually you have a light on your tank. You don't need another light. I've never really looked, noticed a difference. I just use regular daylight. Um, if I'm not using like this hang on or hang in the tank thing, and now that it's getting hotter, I don't have to hang this into the tank. I did that during the winter when it was very cold, but now that it's hot, I can just put this on a little cup or on a stand somewhere and just have that, have that hatching. Um, I don't, there's, if you do it right, there's no way that the salt water will ever go into your tank. Okay, so we're coming up on an hour, which is how long I usually do my uh, live streams. So if you guys have any more questions, I'm happy to answer them for you. I think I talked about basically all that I wanted to talk about. Um, overall, I just think that if you're trying to breed fish, try to start off with as cheap um, equipment as you can or as you need. Um, there's no reason to do a very, very expensive setup in the very beginning. Most fish will happily breed if they're comfortable. And the key is to make your fish comfortable and the key is not to have the most high tech setups for breeding fish. Um, like I'm talking about, like, you know, we talked about, um, catapa leaves earlier and the catapa leaves serve a very specific purpose for my next breeding project. Right. 
I didn't use the Katapa leaves for the Cardinals or the um, Emperor Tetris because you didn't need to. And you also don't need Katapa leaves for breeding bettas. People love putting Katapa leaves in the bettas tanks, right? And I'm telling you, like, if you have just safe tap water, you can breed your bettas in tap water. And if you need, like, a little, um, like, thing for the bettas to make the spawning, um, the bubble nest under, you can use, number one, styrofoam. The styrofoam cup, like, just cut it in half and put it on the water like that. Your bettas will make the nest under the, the styrofoam. Or something even cooler is... If you have something like a plastic bag, just a, just a regular plastic bag, cutting like a like a rectangle from the plastic bag and just floating that on top of the tank is perfect for making a bed as like bubble nest. There's no reason to go get yourself um, the top of these. Invest in more baby brine shrimp or maybe like an air pump to hatch baby brine shrimp. I bred quarries and live bears, but failed to get them to full size. Any tips? Um, so, quarries for quarries. I've never bred quarries, so just a disclaimer there. I really don't know much about quarries, but for live bears, the issue with live bears is the females will still eat the young if you don't separate them. So, if you separate them and they're still having trouble, um, reaching full size, um, it could be that you're just not feeding the right foods. Um, now, that's assuming that you have the right, like, water. So, okay, I see you just add, I've never fed baby rind shrimp in the past. Maybe I'll need to. If your guppies um, are not eating, then you can try baby brine shrimp. But I think if I remember correctly, my guppies, newborn guppies are able to just, like, eat, like, algae off of the moss or just like they'll like nibble on flake foods um what i like to do is i'll have like the float on like fry rearing i'll just use a plastic cup cut some holes in like very small holes that the fry won't fit through and then just float it on the top with some like egg carton styrofoam and i'll cut a hole through it and i'll put that in there and i'll put a rock and that's like a diy floating hatchery and so i'll Put the fry in there, add some baby brine shrimp. I, I, I'm pretty sure the eggs, the guppies will eat baby brine shrimp like immediately after getting born because they, they, they're really big fry for, for, for fish. Um, so baby brine shrimp is a really, really good food. For me, probably the most nutritious live food that I think um, the most effective live food too. So try baby brine shrimp. If that does not work, um, try getting like these the little powder um, fish foods. Let's see, I don't think I have one here, but you can you can also like grind up fish food like adult fish food in a mortar and pestle, and they'll go ahead and eat that too. And you can feed that, keep your water clean, keep your temperature constant. And you should not have a problem as long as there's no predate. As long as there's no preda predation, the water parameters are good, and you feed well. Those are the three things that um, you should be looking out for. Okay, so we're at an hour now. I will see you guys next time. Thank you guys so much for tuning in into this live stream, and um, yeah. Yeah, that. Oh, that the uh, Hakari powdered food. Um, I think those might even be a little bit too small for guppies, right? Um, you don't you don't need that powdered food. Um, you can just grind up normal fish food, and it'll save you a lot of money um, in the long run. Bye, guys.